Live from Atlanta, 11 Alive at 5 starts now. Police arrest an accused serial rapist. How investigators say they linked him to Metro Atlanta crimes dating back more than 20 years. I never dreamed it would ever happen to me. Never. 20 people still missing right now after tornadoes battered neighborhoods in central Tennessee and near Nashville. Tonight we're hearing from the survivors who cannot believe that they have survived. But first, we continue to answer your questions about the two confirmed cases of coronavirus here in Metro Atlanta and who may have been in contact with them before they were diagnosed. We have seen a lot of false information shared online today. Our goal is to give you all the facts without spreading fear. So here's what we can confirm for you tonight. There are still only two cases in Fulton County, a teenage son and father who are both already starting to feel better. We learned today before the son started feeling sick, he went to a homeschool learning center where other students were as well. The center in Cherokee County now is taking steps to make sure the virus does not spread any further. And Joe Hankey was in contact with the Learning Center's owner today. And they are taking some precautions, Joe. Jeff, several precautions. The Fulton County Health Director says the teen felt symptoms last Thursday. Living Science Learning Center tells us the teen attended class there the day before. Tonight, a number of families have been asked to self-quarantine. And the Learning Center in Cherokee County is closed until next week. On Tuesday, Fulton County Interim Health Director Dr. Elizabeth Ford said health officials are trying to find everyone who came into contact with Georgia's two COVID-19 patients between the time they began feeling sick and when they headed to the doctor. Trying to make sure that we reach out to anybody who may have been exposed to either the child or the adult. Ford says a 56-year-old man returned to Fulton County on February 22nd from a conference in Milan, Italy, and began feeling symptoms on February 25th. His son showed symptoms two days later, and after being tested at their doctor's office, positive COVID-19 results came back on Monday. While Ford says the teen is homeschooled, this afternoon Living Science, a homeschool study center, sent 11 Alive this email. The center confirmed the 15-year-old attended class at the center last Wednesday, the day before he began experiencing symptoms. The letter reads, Georgia Department of Public Health has contacted the families directly who have children in the same Wednesday class as the student. The Department of Health has asked those families to self-quarantine voluntarily for the two-week incubation period of the virus and to wait to return to class until March 12th. The center is now closed. A move Living Science says the state did not require, but it is doing so in an abundance of caution and gives families the greatest freedom to determine how to best care for their children. While closed, teachers will use online resources to help parents continue their child's homeschooling. And the center today did not release details of how many families are being asked to self-quarantine. We do want to stress health officials say the child felt symptoms a day after he attended class at Living Science. The CDC reports there have been reports of people without symptoms spreading COVID-19, but it is not thought to be the main way the virus is spreading. Cheryl. All right, Joe, thanks a lot. It is important to note most cases of coronavirus are mild, like what we've seen with the two cases in Georgia, both of those in Fulton County. From February 16th through the 24th, the World Health Organization surveyed 56,000 patients with this strain of coronavirus. They found 80% of cases experienced mild symptoms. Nearly 13.8% of the cases were severe. Just over 6% of the cases involved patients who were critically ill. New tonight, State Farm is restricting all non-essential travel for employees due to coronavirus. In a statement, the company says it's restricting the, the run through March. They hope this will prevent employees from contracting and spreading the virus. According to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle, State, employ, uh, State Farm employs about 7,000 people in Metro Atlanta, making it the 15th largest employer in Atlanta. On Friday afternoon, the president will travel here to Atlanta, Cheryl. He is expected to discuss how the country as a whole is responding to the coronavirus outbreak. Today, the House and Senate reached a multi-billion dollar deal to fight the spread of the virus in the United States. It's three times more than the initial ask from the White House. It's $7.8 billion. It will fund research and development of vaccines, support state and local efforts to help small businesses. There's also $500 million that will be used over a 10-year period period towards a remote health care program. Lawmakers are expected to vote on this deal by the end of the day. 
Our medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy, is going to be answering your questions about coronavirus live on our 11 Alive YouTube page. We're going to check in with her. She's with Jennifer Bellamy coming up in just a little bit. We'll check in with them at 530. So if you do have a question for Dr. Reddy, here is the number to text. Again, text, don't call, 404-873-9114. Include your first name and where you are from, and we'll try our best to get your ans uh, answers to you. If you'd like more information on coronavirus, including how Metro Atlanta schools are preparing, you can find that information on our 11 Live app. You can look for it in the As Seen on TV section. Well, it's still raining, <laughs> and uh, it's been going on now for 10 weeks. We're hoping for a break at some point. The system now moving through Metro Atlanta Stop me if you've heard this before. Will we see the sun again? Oh, yes. Chris Holcomb joins us. Chris, I was thinking if you got a quarter for every time <laughs> someone know. said, when's it going to stop raining, you'd be a very rich man. I would be very rich, and I would not have to be here today working. <laughs> but uh, I'm here to let you know that there is light at the end of the tunnel, but we still have to get through yet another 24 hours before this moves out. I'm thinking by this time tomorrow, we'll begin to see this rain tapering off. And then during the evening tomorrow, it's going to be out of here and we'll really have that drying out process finally by Friday and for the weekend. But as of right now, we still have this rain that is over us right now. A little bit of a break around Atlanta. Have a pretty good coverage of light rain on the north side. A break from Atlanta down to the south, but that's not going to last long at all because more rain is going to be moving through our area. In fact, you can see it in motion here. These showers that have been moving through, but more of this over to the south and west of us will keep pushing in as well. Look at all the lightning with the stronger storms down to the south. That is going to stay to the south. We're not concerned about any strong storms here. Our air is a little more stable. Here's what we're going to be watching as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours tonight. We still have that flash flood watch in effect until late tomorrow when this rain moves out. We've already had significant rain and yet another one and a half to three inches of rain is possible between now and tomorrow afternoon. In fact, if you think it's been rainy, it's going to be even rainier tonight and early tomorrow with more of those pockets of heavy shower activity. Stay with us. We'll talk more about the timing of when that sunshine is going to return and if it'll stick with us through the whole weekend. An alleged serial rapist accused of attacking women for more than two decades finally is in jail tonight. The DeKalb County District Attorney says Wesley Cooley is linked to sexual assaults dating back to 1999 here in Metro Atlanta. Caitlin Ross was there today when Cooley's arrest was at long last denounced. The alleged attacks spanned years and miles around DeKalb County, Atlanta and Conyers. And the district attorney says she's sure there are more victims out there. That's why she's asking everyone to look at these three different booking photos of Wesley Cooley throughout the years because people may have encountered him at different times in his life. He was denied bond at his hearing this morning with the judge ruling he is a significant danger to the community and would likely attack again. The remand comes after years of attacking women with the victims ranging in age from 15 to 38. His DNA was collected after a sexual assault in Tucker in 2017 on North Wake Parkway. The DA says the DA links him to a total of five assaults in DeKalb, two in Atlanta, and one in Conyers. Today is about the victims on whose behalf we advocate. Victims who for too long have been marginalized, not believed, forgotten, and hidden in the shadows. Today we say, we see you. We will continue to fight for you, to seek answers and justice on your behalf, no matter how long it takes. The DA says they got a break in this cold case after the state received a federal grant to clear a backlog of untested rape kits. At six, we're looking at how many charges have been filed since the state got that much needed funding. Thanks a lot, Caitlin. All right, topping your speed feed tonight, we are learning more about the plane crash in Oconee County that killed three people. The plane crashed off Elder Road yesterday afternoon. The FAA is investigating and says the plane was heading from South Carolina to Alabama. The sheriff's office says they've tentatively identified the people on board. The victims' names have not yet been released publicly. One of the men accused of firing shots inside of a Douglasville Best Buy is now in jail. Arnaldo Rodriguez and another man are accused of firing their guns, stealing a laptop and two drones, then running out of the store on Monday. Police arrested Rodriguez after somebody saw him inside another Best Buy in Metro Atlanta. His partner got away. If you recognize this man, please call police. And the GBI is asking for the community's help in finding a missing teenager. 17-year-old Julia Mann disappeared from her home in Oconee County on February 20th. 
There's currently a $7,000 reward for any information that leads to bringing her home. A Checkers employee is accused of shooting at two customers after a mix-up with their fast food order. Mara Siriani was out in DeKalb County this morning where she talked to one victim's mother. DeKalb police say an employee at this Checkers restaurant is accused of shooting a person after a dispute over an incorrect food order. This all happening just before midnight Wednesday at the Checkers drive through here along Candler Road, not far from I-20. DeKalb police arresting 24-year-old Jonte Robinson, who they say works here. Investigators say the victim was found shot in the chest. He was rushed to the hospital and is expected to be okay. We talked to the victim's mother, who says when her son told the employee about the mix-up, that's when he allegedly pointed a gun through the window and fired shots. Um, they had a mix up in their orders and they both were upset, him and both of the guys. And the employee stuck a gun out of the drive through window and shot at both of them. Robinson is charged with aggravated assault. The incident is still under investigation. Up next, a recall on IKEA furniture that anybody with children really needs to hear. We know you have questions and concerns. We know there's fear, but when fear drives us, we overreact and underprepare. So here's our promise to you as 11 Alive covers coronavirus. We promise that fear will never be our goal. We'll find the best experts and ask informed questions. We'll hold the powerful accountable to answer them. We'll bring you context and perspective to numbers that are always changing. We will always try our best to answer all of your questions. And if you're not getting the information you need or think there are other stories we need to share, please let us know. We are here to serve you, our community, with facts to help you prepare, be safe, and have some peace of mind. Athens Clark County voters will spend the rest of the presidential primary season voting on hand marked paper ballots. The county election board decided to stop using the state's new electronic voting system because of concerns about ballot secrecy. 11 Lives Doug Richards reports from Athens. About 500 people had voted at this early voting site in Athens on the state's new voting machines before the local election board decided to stop using them. Voters who appeared here today were presented with hand-marked paper ballots instead. The election board said that the configuration of the state's new touchscreen voting machines could not guarantee a secret ballot, that election workers and other voters could see too easily the votes being cast on the state's larger and brighter computer screens. Jean DeFort was among those who had complained about the lack of privacy. The, the precincts, the polling places that they've been using were configured to fit the old equipment. The new equipment is bigger and there needs to be more of it. So 10 pounds in a five pound sack, it just isn't gonna work in many, many precincts. Athens Clark County's rejection of the state's new voting system only applies through the March presidential primary. But there's another primary statewide scheduled in May, which may require another decision from this and perhaps other Georgia counties. All right, Doug, thank you. The Secretary of State, whose office approved the new $100 million statewide voting system, declined comment. The decision in Clark County comes just days after a judge in another county ruled Georgia's new voting machines are private enough. Last week, a lawsuit was filed in Sumter County alleging the new machines didn't offer enough privacy. A judge ruled there was no need for hand-marked paper ballots in that county. Georgia's Secretary of State advised county election workers to position the voting machines toward the wall. That way, the screens cannot be seen from the rest of the room. Another contender leaving the race after a disappointing Super Tuesday performance. Mike Bloomberg's announcement tops three things you need to know this evening. The former New York City mayor dropped out of the race for the Democratic presidential nomination today. He dropped nearly a half a million dollars on television, radio, social media ads for Super Tuesday when voters in 14 states cast their ballots. But he had little to show for it, ending with 24 delegates. He joined former candidates Senator Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg in endorsing Joe Biden. We'll have more on Mr. Biden's Super Tuesday performance in the next 30 minutes. IKEA is recalling more than 800,000 dressers that can tip over 
and of course injured children. If you have a, a Cullen three drawer chest, IKEA says you ought to stop using it unless it is anchored to the wall and then put it somewhere where children aren't anywhere near it. You can return it to IKEA and uh, they will give you uh, money for it. They will also return it. IKEA is offering free wall anchoring kits if you decide to keep the Cullen. A new study is showing that many women face financial hard times after being diagnosed with breast cancer. The CDC says more than half of the 800 patients they had surveyed had money problems due to the cancer care. More than 80% used their own money to pay for out-of-pocket costs, while almost a quarter left some bills unpaid. Women who were diagnosed at a more advanced stage and those without a college degree were more likely to experience financial hardships. All right, folks, you know what time it is. You see your screen. It is time for Wednesday's edition of The A Scene, and we are heading to the red carpet of the Georgia film movie called Burden, starring Garrett Hudlin, Crystal Fox, and Forrest Whitaker, and Atlanta's very own Usher. As a Ku Klux Klan museum opens up in a small town in South Carolina, Reverend Kennedy strives to keep the peace, all while urging the group's grand dragon to denounce his racist past. Uh, once you understand where a person uh, has come from, uh, then uh, you have to work toward bringing about a constructive change. If this ain't a sign, then I don't know what it is. I just left that man in this house. You're out of order, Klansman. How did you develop the strength to be able to sway Mike Burden and tell him that that's not the path that he should be going down? That was a battle, but... I told him it was either me or that. So. You know, when I read the article that a KKK museum could open up in a small southern town in 1996, that kind of overt bigotry and racism in 1996, are you kidding? So, you know, I felt the obligation when I read those stories. You were on the ground, they poured gasoline on you. Take me to where you were, getting ready for that scene and what was going through your head while you were on that ground, knowing that some of your ancestors went through this exact same thing. At some point, I felt like my character would fight but he can't. He's like, no, in order for you to really understand the reality of what Clarence experienced, he didn't fight back. Mr. Whitaker, there was a point in the film where there was literally a bullet target on your back, but because you didn't retaliate, you survived. Mm -hmm. You feel like that's the constant burden that is on the backs of so many black men. I, mean, I think that it is, I mean, to be able to be strong enough to be able to go through all the oppression and the problems and the anger, you know, and to be able to be your own person, strong and true. I mean, I was in his home and he was talking about when he had to put his family on the, on the ground, the helicopters were going over all his house, wondering whether they were going to live or die, but living by this principle that we all have the right to live a, a life full of equality, you know what I mean, and full of peace and full of love. And then I'll fight for that. He'll fight for that. He's a protest minister. That's what he calls himself. I haven't met many people who say, I'm a protest minister. Yeah. And that protest minister, you saw him. He was the first one to talk in my story. And that was the real-life Reverend Kennedy and the real-life Judy as well on the carpet. Burden was so good, and directors and producers tell me they chose Georgia to film because it's actually similar to South Carolina. They shot in the town square in Jackson, Georgia, and say they love the people there, all our southern hospitality. Burden is out in theaters right now. Our radar has just been working overtime. I think it deserves a break. It's been scanning the skies, picking up all the radar echoes out there of the rain that's been falling, still picking up a lot of rain in the area, mainly light stuff on the north side. If you look north of I-20 here into North Georgia, up in North Gwinnett, up toward Dahlonega, Ella J, Ivy Log, Dalton, Calhoun, Canton area, uh, showers up near the Gainesville area near Helen as well. Generally light rain that's moving through there. If we come back closer to Atlanta, you see we had some showers that came through here earlier. We're in a little bit of a break, although it's still really wet out there with wet roads and some mist and drizzle around. And there's more on the way. You can see these showers that are developing back into Alabama. Those will keep moving our way. The good news is the really heavy rain with the thunder and lightning, that's down to the south and that it looks like it's going to stay to the south of us. We have a lot of lightning here south of Macon, uh, down into parts of South Georgia. That's all moving Moving to the east. Our air is a little more stable here, so we're not concerned about stronger storms developing here. It's just going to be all this rain that we have. Here's a look at the roads right now. Even though we don't have active rain falling here in Midtown, looking down on 85 in the Buford Highway connector, it's pretty soggy out there. And in Noonan, we have wet conditions there too. Stay with us. We have to get through yet another 24 plus hours of this rain. Then we finally dry out. We'll have those sunny details coming up at about the bottom of the hour. At least 24 people killed. Many more are now missing after a string 
of tornadoes hit near Nashville in central Tennessee. Amid the widespread destruction, one community coming together. The motivation to remain strong is coming up next. You see the video from Tennessee and ju uh. just shake your head in the face of those awful mm. and deadly tornadoes. We are hearing some incredible stories of survival and hope. Of the 24 deaths reported so far, 18 of them are from Cookville. As you can imagine, emotions are really raw, but the community's resilience is undeniable. Wow. NBC's Sam Brock has their story tonight. In the heart of heartache. It's unbelievable. I never dreamed it would ever happen to me. Never. Tornado victims reacting to homes hammered by Mother Nature's power. It's pretty devastating. And that's 41 years of work. Water reflecting pools of debris. School shattered into a thousand pieces. And worst of all, dozens of lives lost. Among them, Carl Frazee, pictured here with his family, killed in his home. And Michael Dolfini and Aubrey Sexton, who died after a night out in Nashville. Two of my friends died last night. Sarah Johnson um, says she was at a local bar with them when disaster struck. They were leaving the bar. What I believe, what I was heard um, from inside was that a tree had impacted their vehicle. We are strong and we are rallying for our people. On the streets of Nashville, that determination on display. We're looking at trying to rebuild lives. You know, not just houses, not structures, but just lives. You might recognize Taylor Hicks from American Idol, the country music singer among the many victims here. The vibration is what I'll never forget. He shared his survival story, jamming himself inside this closet in his garage. You won season five of American Idol. You said that six months was insane. Not as insane as the 30 seconds in there. Doesn't even compare. I mean, doesn't even compare. Just down the street, parishioners praying outside of a church with no facade. I went outside and, uh, you know, after this minute and a half of fury, um, I walked outside and uh, I looked up and it was uh, the clearest, starriest southern sky that you can possibly imagine. What did you think when you were looking at the stars? I think everybody was thanking their lucky stars to be alive. Wow. How long can coronavirus live on surfaces and will warm weather stop the spread? Many of you have questions about coronavirus and our 11 Alive medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy, is answering them live. That's coming up next. United Airlines is now reducing the number of its flights by 10%, both internationally and inside the United States in response to coronavirus. This is after President Trump met with CEOs from major airlines to talk about the industry's response to the outbreak. After the meeting, the president stressed that people should still feel safe to travel, especially travel within the United States. As of today, 11 people have died from coronavirus in the United States. The first death outside of Washington state was confirmed in California. It's not just airlines now ramping up their response. Fort Benning is now ramping up coronavirus screenings for new recruits. So far, no recruits have tested positive. The screenings include questions about travel and health. Recruits with any increased risk factors or showing signs of illness will be moved to health centers on base. At 11 Alive, we are committed to offering you the facts on the outbreak and not spreading fear, which is why we want to emphasize out of the estimated 10 million people who live in Georgia, only two have confirmed cases of coronavirus. And right now on the 11 Alive YouTube page, Jennifer Bellamy and 11 Alive medical correspondent Dr. Sujatha Reddy are answering your questions about coronavirus. They are doing so live. We know so many of you do have questions. A lot of you have concerns. Dr. Reddy is a practicing physician. We have trusted her for so many years yeah. to bring us accurate information about your health and well-being. So let's check in with them now. What questions are you seeing more most often and, and Dr. Reddy even hearing most office with, often within your practice? 
Hi guys, we are getting a lot of questions throughout the week. We do want to remind you of that number so you can text those questions, not call them to us. We'll be fielding them on our 11 Alive YouTube page. That number is 404-873-9114. Uh, Dr. Reddy, you're all kind of wondering what kind of questions y'all are seeing from people at your practice. Yeah, we've been seeing the regular questions like, should we be worried? You know, what do we do if we think we have it? I think that's actually a really good question. Mm -hmm. Um, I've actually been surprised that more patients when they come to us haven't asked a lot of questions because I think here in Georgia, besides the recent cases, the two that we've had, we've really not had that much to deal with here in Georgia. But if you think you have it, the thing to do is uh, if you have symptoms, get a mask if you're going to be around people, new people, people in your family. If, if you have some sort of virus, you've probably already passed it amongst family members. But if you're going to be out, then I would wear a mask. But if you're worried about it, the thing to do is call your primary care or your hospital's ER, whatever you decide to go to, and see if they have the testing kits. We're told that here in Georgia, we do have kits, so they'll have to either be tested at that location or send the specimen out, but we do have kits here in Georgia. But I think calling ahead of time makes sense because you're going to know what door to go through. Do they have the ability to take care of me? Should I go somewhere else? And I think part of that, too, is going to be based on how severe your symptoms are. Because mm -hmm. if you're really short of breath and possibly have lung problems, you may need to be admitted to a hospital. So then it makes sense to go to, to an actual yeah. hospital. Some of the other questions we've been receiving, wondering about the coronavirus itself, is it airborne and how is it spread? Yeah, great question. This virus is spread very much like the flu or cold. It's what we call droplet infection. So if somebody coughs or sneezes or you're talking to them and they happen to maybe, you know, spittle on you, that is how the virus is spread. It's droplet. It, it is, can be in the air. It's passed through an infected person's secretions as far as coughing, sneezing, um, runny nose, that type of thing. Uh, something else that I asked you myself before we got started here, um, we're in that little change of weather season, people wondering if coronavirus will be impacted by warmer weather, if we won't be seeing it as much, um, or if we know about that. You know, I think it's too early to say, again, this is a new virus, that's one of the frustrating things about it, but typically, the reason we see colds and flus in the colder climate and colder months is when it's warmer, we're not all in the same facility, all huddled together in the house. We're out and about doing things. And when you're outside, you're not in close contact with people. But in the winter, we tend to be you know, in our homes, in our offices, and we don't really go out much. And that is why in the winter months, we see more colds and flus. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I know we've talked a lot about people washing their hands, cleaning services, um, and the way they would typically be doing that. But how long can the coronavirus live on different types of surfaces? Yeah, that's a great question. The best data that we have right now is it probably lives a few hours on hard surfaces. Right now, the thought is it doesn't survive on soft materials, okay. but on hard surfaces, probably for a few hours. All right, Dr. Reddy, thank you so much. We are going to continue answering your questions right now on the 11 Alive YouTube page. Again, you can text those questions. Please don't call. You can text them to 404-873-9114, and we'll continue to ask those questions for you guys. All right. Thank you both so much. I know a lot of questions have been coming in and, and will continue to. A quick update now to a story we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. An elderly couple from Atlanta, remember they were quarantined in Japan after traveling on board the Diamond Princess cruise ship? Well, they are getting ready to come home. Clyde and Renee Smith were being quarantined in a hospital in Tokyo. They tested positive for coronavirus. Today, their son posted on Facebook that they have now tested negative two different times, so they're able to be released. He thanked the nurses who took such good care of them. He said their symptoms were always fairly mild, so they are feeling great and ready to come back home. You can read more about their experience in quarantine on our 11 Live app. Look for the story in the As Seen on TV section. We're dealing with more rain out there today. It's mainly light stuff here in Metro Atlanta and North Georgia. And you can see here over North Georgia, kind of a broken area of light rain. There are some holes in that with some drier air trying to briefly fill in as this moves up toward the north and east. Still a good coverage of that rain from Gainesville, Dahlonega, up into parts of Fannin and Gilmer County, Rabin County, White County, seeing some of those showers there. Here in Atlanta, some breaks in the city, but on the north side, we still have some light rain and also to the south. But there's another wave that you can 
can see here coming in from the west from Alabama that's pushing in to the Rome area also south and west of the city and that's just going to continue that motion here to the north and east. So while you're getting a little break in the action right now, more of it is coming in and and we're going to see even additional rain moving our way as well. This extends all the way back into Mississippi, Louisiana, also into Arkansas. So we're going to see this rain chance sticking with us not only tonight, but for much of the day tomorrow and at times that rain can be heavy. Now I know you're also looking at this down to the south. This is where we have some stronger storms that have been developing here from Macon between Macon and Valdosta south of the Macon area. A lot of thunder and lightning with these. Some of these have been strong. We had a report of a dam breach in the Crisp County area uh, that is actually causing some flooding there from a five acre pond. Uh, so uh, authorities are keeping a close eye on that as well. This thunder and lightning is going to stay down to the south though. Here's a live look. This is in Gwinnett County where you see the rain that is coming down. We've moved the camera over to the parking lot so you can see that rain as it's kind of reflecting there on the parking lot looking over Sugarloaf Parkway and uh, wet conditions here at 75 and 285. Even though it's not real active rain coming down right now, uh, the roads are still wet there. So here's what we're watching uh, through the rest of the nighttime hours. If you're concerned about that severe weather risk, we're really not going to see strong storms here. That is going to be down to the south where you see the yellow. That's where we have the level two risk uh, down in South Georgia. And then tomorrow that's going to stay to our south and we're going to have just the general showers. But we do have that flash flood watch that's in effect from Atlanta on down into central Georgia and South Georgia. An additional one and a half to three inches of rain coming our way. We already have a lot of high stream flows and creeks and streams and rivers, so we still have to watch for that potential for flash flooding. I know it's been really soggy the past few days, but the rain that's coming in tonight and into tomorrow is actually going to be heavier and more concentrated compared to what we've already seen there. We finally begin to dry out. Now the rain moves out during the day tomorrow, uh, late in the day, and then we dry out for Friday, decreasing clouds 59, 61 Saturday, mostly sunny, mostly sunny on Sunday, only a low rain chance Monday, and then about a 30 to 40% chance as we get into Tuesday and Wednesday with high temperatures near 70 degrees. Tal time now for our weather wow moment. The warmer air is waking up the bears. Storm tracker Shannon shared this video with us. This is at her home on Burnt Mountain. So the bears are kind of getting rustled up a little bit, getting out looking for a little bit of food. We would love to see your weather wow moments. And uh, the best way to do that is on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers and then join that group. It's an exclusive weather community where we talk about weather, share pictures and videos. And that's one of the first places we go when we look to share pictures on TV. Topping our speed feed tonight, DeKalb County is hoping a new emergency services hub is going to cut down on ambulance response times. DeKalb County has a contract with the ambulance company AMR. It has received several complaints of slow response times and even negligence over the years. The county's leveled more than $1 million in fines against AMR, but still decided to sign a new five-year contract last year. They're hoping the new hub on Brookhaven Highway will help reduce those times. The county spent $2 million on new ambulances on top of $5 million for new equipment and some other improvements. STG Healthcare has agreed to pay over a million dollars to resolve false claim allegations. The company is accused of submitting false claims to Medicare and Medicaid for patients who were not terminally ill. STG Healthcare is going to pay $1.75 million to settle these allegations. 15-year-old William Floyd is a Make-A-Wish child from Georgia, and he got his wish granted to be on the video game NBA 2K. His family got to go out to the 2K headquarters in California. He was put into the video game with players, and they can download them. Floyd is the first non-NBA player ever to be included in the game. Ever wonder what happened to this guy? I remember him. Do you remember him? I, I think do. a lot of people do. This local pastor went viral after holding a sign as he stood waiting for his wife to finish shopping. Jeremy Tuck says this was his way of standing up and voicing his opinion. Nick Sturdivant recently sat down with Jeremy and his wife in this week's Whatever Happened To. Every time Jeremy Tuck talks about it, he gets that look from his wife, Akila. And so, yeah, I, I just, that's pretty, <laughs> the sign basically said my wife uh, is in Target two plus hours. Uh, 
everything is fine. I'm not homeless. This picture of him holding a cardboard sign in front of Target was posted back in November with the hashtag, I will not be silent, racking up thousands of likes and hundreds of shares and becoming one of the more relatable moments for people around the world. I was actually at home taking a nap, scrolling through Facebook, and I see it on Facebook. And I was like, what's he doing? And people were calling, like, did you see what Jeremy put on Facebook? So actually, I was doing it uh, to actually remedy her from going into Target to try to stop her, slow her down from going into Target. And it actually countered what I wanted to do. Uh, so, yeah, so it, it, it didn't work. Jeremy said he got the idea from a comic. Jeremy is the senior pastor at Living Faith Tabernacle in Forest Park. Him and Nikila are the parents of five boys. And sometime our date nights, he'll go with me every once in a while. Three you can plus lose track hours. in time. And since the viral moment, Target continues to be a big part of their lives. That next Sunday, our security team all dressed up like Target employees. Uh, and everything. Uh, they even threw her a Target baby shower. It allowed people to see us uh, in a different light outside of church. Uh, it allowed people to know that we're normal people just like everybody else. Oh, a lot of men can relate to that one. All right, she was walking alone in the cold, received the surprise of a lifetime. We're talking to an officer about his incredible act of kindness towards this Metro Atlanta mom. Next. It has been a good five days for Joe Biden. You stretch back to Saturday in South Carolina and then last night, Super Tuesday, launched him to the top of the 2020 Democratic field. Now, he is hoping a new endorsement from another ex-rival will keep up his Joe-mentum in a series of pivotal matchups with Senator Bernie Sanders over the next couple of weeks. Alice Barr is in Washington with NBC. She has the latest. Joe Biden supercharged today after a night that was expected to tilt toward Bernie Sanders. We are very much alive! Super Tuesday instead rocketing Biden to the top in what is rapidly becoming a head-to-head -head matchup with Sanders, a showdown between the party's moderate and progressive wings. What this campaign, I think, is increasingly about is which side are you on? The Biden boost continuing today with a new endorsement from Mike Bloomberg, who ended his short, expensive and unsuccessful run. Today, pledging to use his considerable resources to help Biden beat President Trump. I entered the race for president to defeat Donald Trump. And today, I am leaving the race for the same reason. Sanders leads in Tuesday's biggest prize, California, though a large number of mail-in ballots mean it's still too early to call. NBC News projects he did carry Colorado, Utah, and Vermont. Biden picking up 10 projected wins from New England to the Midwest and a clean sweep of southern states, surging to a surprise victory in delegate-rich Texas. I think the Democrats have sent the signal that they really want to come after Trump. Um, and they think Biden is, got, is the guy to do it. The last wild card, Elizabeth Warren, assessing her path forward after a dismal Super Tuesday, finishing third in her home state of Massachusetts. Elizabeth Warren, if she does drop out and endorse Bernie Sanders, this race will tighten even more. Two candidates now squaring off to slug out the nominations state by state in the weeks ahead. Several states are getting ready for changes to the food stamps program, or SNAP. People critical of these new rules say it's going to knock nearly 700,000 people off of the program. Social service agencies say they would not be able to make up the difference and help those families. The changes limit states' ability to give waivers to recipients who do not meet the 20-hour per work week requirement. Some states have filed a lawsuit to block these new rules. The Trump administration says it's going to save the country more than $5 billion over the next five years. The changes are set to take effect April 1st. Delta is cutting back on the number of flights to Japan through April 30th because of coronavirus. Delta says fewer people are buying those flights, so Delta is still offering change fee waivers for anybody who needs to adjust their travel plans because of travel advisories related to the outbreak. And that, of course, is effective all around the world.
Rainy conditions out there right now, even though we're seeing just a brief break in the rain in Atlanta, where there's no active heavy rain falling, a little bit of mist and drizzle, it's coming back. You can see this activity that is just over to the west of us, light rain falling in West Georgia to the north and west of us as well. Also down to the south and west. It's a little heavier as you get toward Thomaston and then even that thunder and lightning down in South Georgia. That thunder and lightning is going to stay to the south of us. We're just going to see more of this rain that pushes in here. You can see it stretches all the way back through Alabama, Mississippi, even into Arkansas and Louisiana. Take a look at the bigger picture. You can see what we've been watching out there for today. And yeah, it was a little cooler today. Yesterday's high was 69. Today it was 62, and that was even after midnight. Our afternoon temperatures pretty much held in the upper 50s, but we picked up uh, between a half inch and three quarters of an inch. So now our surplus, we're 11 inches above average in rainfall for the year, and more is coming tonight with that flash flood watch in effect. Stay with us. We do see some light at the end of the tunnel, and that light is sunshine. I'll let you know when that arrives at six. Sun? Sun. sun? He actually said sun. A Gwinnett <laughs> County officer being recognized for making a little girl's birthday extra special. Sergeant Nick Boney saw this woman walking alone with a bouquet of balloons. Her daughter had just turned one. She said she was on her way home to celebrate. Sergeant Boney knew he needed to help. He not only gave her a ride home, but he also instructed Officer Jimmy Wilson to buy the little girl a birthday cake. Sergeant Boney says... He is just happy he had the chance to make that mother's life a little bit easier. Buying a birthday cake for a one-year-old for a family who, a mother who's obviously trying to make it with her family and make their kid's life the best that she can, that's just one person doing something for another person. We can all do that. Um, it's not a police officer buying a birthday cake for another person. That's just one individual helping out another I tell you, the little girls, when they ran up to give us a hug and stuff, that was just, uh, it was just like it was part of the family. The officers ended up meeting the little girl and then delivered the surprise in person. They were greeted with a lot of hugs. Everyone then gathered around the table where they sang happy birthday together as a family. Coronavirus symptoms can be similar to the common cold and the flu, so should doctors treat it the same way? Our Verify team has your answer coming up next. As the coronavirus spreads, many are starting to ask if doctors should treat it the same way as they would treat the flu. The World Health Organization has said that they've gotten that question many times, so they feel that it today. Our Verify team is breaking it all down to give you the facts. Here's Jason Puckett. There are a lot of alarming headlines out there about coronavirus, but being alarmist doesn't help you protect your family. We want to give you the facts in a straightforward, well-researched manner. Take this for example. A lot of people are comparing coronavirus to the flu, but are they even similar? First, look at the number of cases. In the U.S., there have been between 32 and 45 million cases of the flu this year. Only about 100 cases of coronavirus have been confirmed. So then why are people online talking about wearing masks and stocking up on groceries? It's a question the World Health Organization wanted to answer, so they looked into it. And the answer comes down to one thing. Fear of the unknown. This virus is not SARS, it's not MERS, and it's not influenza. WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Cabresa says even though they're not the same, coronavirus and the flu do have one similarity. Both COVID-19 and influenza cause respiratory disease and spread the same way. Both viruses spread by droplets from <coughs> coughing or sneezing. Beyond that, they're totally different. COVID-19 does not transmit as efficiently as influenza. In fact, the flu spreads much easier than coronavirus because people spread germs that can cause the flu, even if they don't have symptoms. Another significant difference between the two, this coronavirus is brand new. While many people globally have built up immunity to seasonal flu strains, COVID-19 is a new virus to which no one has immunity. That means the effects of coronavirus tend